uh, still talking about missing data here, and uh, we've talked about um, two main strategies for dealing with missing data, one being maximum likelihood and one being expectation maximum maximization or EM algorithm. So last time we looked at a simple example of the EM algorithm when we had this Poisson data case. Um, missing data was the number of um, individuals who did not show up once at to the ER. We had counts for one visit, two visits, three visits, and nobody showed up for more than three. And I wanted to estimate the population average number of visits to the ER, but I had this missing category. So we derived what the EM algorithm was. There's two main steps. One is to compute the, uh, well first we write down what's called the complete data log likelihood. The log likelihood we would have if we had all the data observed. And then we compute the expectation of that conditional on the observed data and a, per, and a current estimate of the parameter value. That's what we call Q. That's the E step. Q is the objective function that's defined as that conditional expectation. And then the M step maximizes that Q function as a function of lambda. So in our Poisson case, that came out to be relatively simple. The, the Q function was um, mainly just involved this expectation of Y, the count at zero. Once I had that, I could maximize the Q function easily to get a new value of lambda hat, EM algorithm. <clears throat> In a more uh, realistic case, but still a simplistic case, we go back to the pain data example. So these were the data from um, here. We had some kind of diagnosis score. Higher diagnosis means higher severity of the disease. Psych psychological well-being score, and then a pain score. And you were only selected to be involved in the subsequent part of the study where pain was actually measured if you had a sufficiently severe diagnosis. So only individuals with diagnosis greater than 96 have pain measurements, missing at random. So if I wanted to estimate um, parameters to do with these data, I have to deal with the missing data. One way to do that is with um, Maximum likelihood, which we already showed with this data set, log likelihood um, estimation here, but also with the EM algorithm. So the EM algorithm for the um, pain data can proceed like we have here in the subsequent slide. So consider only the two variables, diagnosis and pain. So I'm going to ignore that psychological well-being um, variable for now. And I want to talk about pain as a function of diagnosis. So I have in mind a regression model of pain scores as a function of diagnosis score. The main problem is that my response has a bunch of missing data, missing at random. The EM algorithm can be employed here. Um, it looks like this. So the if I had complete data, if I had no missing data for the pain um, variable, I don't have any missing data for the diagnosis variable. All of those are observed. It's just the pain guy that's missing. But if I had no missing data for either of them, then I could compute the maximum likelihood estimates easy. The MLE of the, of the mean pain score would just be the average of the observed, the N observed pain scores. The variance of the pain scores would just be the sample variance, not the sample variance, but uh, the MLE version of the sample variance. So this, this is the, the straight average square difference of the pain scores from their average. The sample variance would be the same thing divided by n minus 1. The MLE is going to divide by n, though, slightly different from the sample variance. So the MLE of sigma squared p could be written this way if I knew all the values of yp, the pain measurements. And similarly, the covariance between diagnosis and pain can be written this way. It looks like a typical covariance calculation. The only thing is that this is a maximum likelihood estimator, so I divide by n instead of n minus 1. So if I had all the data, if I didn't have missing data, then I could estimate easily the parameters of this relationship, the means, the variances, the covariances, which tell me everything about 
this relationship I'm interested in between pain and diagnosis. Based on these results here, there's only a handful of things that I really need. I don't necessarily have to have every single pain measurement. All I really have to have is these, are these sufficient statistics. So if I knew what the sum of the pain measurements were, if I knew what the sum of the squared pain measurements were, uh, if I knew what the sum of the products of the pain and diagnosis measurements were, those sufficient statistics, I could plug them in to get these estimates. So the EM algorithm for this example is just going to um, plug in the pieces of these sufficient statistics that are necessary to estimate these parameters. It doesn't actually do imputation. We don't wind up, after EM algorithm, we don't wind up with a complete data set. It doesn't impute the missing data it, for final use. It, it kind of imputes them in, internally for the purposes of updating the estimate. But we don't get a complete data set out. We just get estimates of the parameters. The E step would be, um, remember this is like computing an expected value of the thing that's missing as a function of the thing that's observed. So we said back in the EM or the Poisson example, the main piece of the E step was the expected value of the bit that was missing conditional on the bit that was observed. Here it is similar. I'm going to estimate a missing value as a function of the observed value. So if my interest is in pain as a function of diagnosis, then it's natural to say let's regress pain on diagnosis. Let's fit or let's fill in a missing value for the pain observation internally, temporarily, so for the purpose of estimating these parameters with a regression model. So I'm going to say that y hat pi, my estimated or imputed value of y, of y pi, is equal to the regression, the fitted value of a regression relating pain to diagnosis. I can estimate this regression using just these pieces from the previous slide. So if I know the variance of the pain scores, the variance of the diagnosis scores, which I can estimate already because I know all of them, I, I observed all of them, and the covariance between the diagnosis and the pain scores. I can use those to derive or to compute the estimates of the regression model. In particular, beta 1 hat, the slope parameter, can be shown to just be equal to the covariance between those two variables, the response and the predictor, divided by the variance of the predictor. So if you look at the, the formula for beta 1 hat in ordinary least squares, it looks like a sum of the yi minus y bars times xi minus x bars divided by, the, divided by the sum of the xi minus x bar squared. So it looks like a covariance divided by a variance. So beta 1 hat, if I have these estimates, can just be computed this way. Beta 0 hat similarly can be defined um, this way. So once I have the mean for the pain group, I subtract off the slope times the mean for the diagnosis group. So once I have these things, if I have complete data, I can compute these things directly. If I have these things, I can compute this um, regression. Once I have this regression, I can impute a missing value. So we're, you can hopefully see that there's an iterative procedure in, that we're going to be looking at. I'm going to get complete versions of my sufficient statistics so that I can get estimates of these. I'm going to use those to estimate this regression. And then I'm going to use that updated regression to fill in the missing data and repeat. Iterate through this E and M step, E and M step. Um, so if I have missing data on the pain variable, YPI, I'm going to replace YPI, a missing value, with YPI hat, the regressed version of YPI on YDI. So I take these regression coefficients and I get a fitted value for YPI plug that in for the missing value of YPI. Similarly, I replace YPI squared, so I'm thinking back to these sufficient statistics. I can fill in the YPI squareds with um, analogous quantity from fitted value from the regression model. So the expected value of YPI squared would be a variance, uh, the variance of YPI 
would be the expected value of YPI squared minus the expected value of YPI quantity squared. So I can replace YPI squared, a missing value, with YPI hat squared plus that variance. So the variance would equal um, the expected value of, the, of this squared minus the mean squared. I replace a missing value for a squared missing value with the fitted value squared plus this residual variance from the above regression model. So I replace YPI with Y hat PI. I replace YPI squared with Y hat PI squared plus residual variability. I have to add this residual variability because um, an expected value of Y squared has to do with the variance. So variance um, comes into play here, but not, in, not here when I'm estimating just the, uh, the one missing value. Um, so the point is, once I have estimates of these, these maximum likelihood estimates, I can plug them in to get a regression model. Using the regression model, I can iterate to refit, re-impute the pieces of the sufficient statistics that I need to compute the MLEs again. So I'm going to iterate through this procedure. I'll show you what it looks like in code in a second. Um, here's what the numbers shake out to be when I run the code. I'll show you the code in a second again. Um, for initial values like these, mu hat and sigma hat, mu hat is the vector of mean score for diagnosis, mean score for pain. Uh, sigma hat is the covariance matrix between those two variables. I can estimate these variables, these parameters, using complete data. So in particular, using a pairwise deletion um, approach, which is what R does by default. If I ask for um, the mean of the pain scores, and I tell them the mean function na.remove equal true, for example, R will give me the mean of the observed data. If I ask for the variance of the pain scores, na.remove equal true, it'll give me the variance of using just the complete data. So pairwise deletion means you use only the complete observations to compute every piece of this pie, of this puzzle. So I can get initial values, mu hat 0, sigma hat 0, um, using these, if I come back to this slide here, beta 1 hat will be equal to the covariance divided by the variance of the diagnosis score. So the covariance is 0. The variance of the diagnosis score is, is uh, 199.579. So beta 1 hat is 0, 0 divided by something else. Beta 0 hat is mu hat p, which is 11.7 minus beta 1 hat times mu hat d. So beta 1 hat is 0. Beta 0 hat is just 11.7. Sigma squared p given d, the variance of um, the variance of the um, regression model. So if I were to fit this regression model to my data, I would get a re residual variance of 7.344. So if I did LM, summary LM, at the bottom of that output would be residual standard error, is, is where this comes from. 7.344 would be the square of that quantity. Um, so initial values give me initial values for this regression model. Using that initial version of the regression model, I can fill in the sufficient statistics and then I can update the estimates. So once I have all the sufficient statistics completed, so I have internally imputed the missing data for the purposes of computing this. Once I have the data complete, the mean of the diagnosis scores is just the mean of all the observed or the complete diagnosis scores. The mean of the pain scores is just the mean of the complete pain scores. And similarly here for the variances and the covariances. Using these updated MLE estimates, I get updated regression pieces. I use those to, again, fill in the sufficient statistics, repeat to get a new value for mu hat and sigma hat. So my first iteration of the EM algorithm, I wound up with starting values here. I iterated once, and I wound up with new MLE or um, parameter estimates, mu 1 hat, sigma 1 hat. I iterated again. I got mu 2 hat, sigma 2 hat. 
and after many iterations, I converged. So the EM algorithm, remember, goes through many iterations until, it, until the parameter estimates do not change drastically or at all, much at all, between um, iterations. And here was the final iteration. I'll show you the code in a second. The maximum likelihood estimator for these data using the EM algorithm was 100 for the diagnosis score, 100 or 10.2.81 for the pain score. These were the variances and covariances. This is the way the EM algorithm is, can be summarized. EM iteration 0, the initial values were 11.7, 7.344, and 0 for this variance. After many iterations, they think these things converged, 10.28, 8.21-ish, 23.39-ish. The log likelihood can also be computed, and it's printed out in the first column. So you can look at the coefficients or the uh, parameter estimates. They are converging. You can look at the log likelihood, and it is maximizing. It's getting to, to the maximum value that it has available to it. So that's maximum likelihood estimation by the EM algorithm. So let's look at the code for a second. Here are the um, pain data. They look like this. Same data from the slides. EM algorithm, like we did in the slides, just considering the diagnosis and the pain variables. I want to I want to consider pain as a function of diagnosis. Think about pain regressed on diagnosis. I'm going to define a couple of functions. One is the log likelihood function. So you give me the data and your current estimates of the parameter theta, parameter vector theta, and this will print out or return the log likelihood function. So the log likelihood, like we saw in the notes, can be computed piece by piece. For a complete observation, I do it this way. For an observation missing pain, I do it this way. For an observation missing well-being and pain, I do it this way. So I just use the pieces of the parameters that I have data for. Here I only have two variables. I have diagnosis and pain. So the complete example, an observation that's complete, it has both diagnosis and pain observed. So the log likelihood contribution is um, a bivariate density from a bivariate normal distribution. So it's the data for um, diagnosis and pain minus the mean vector for diagnosis and pain, covariance matrix inverted, and then the quadratic piece here. So it's the bivariate density for the normal distribution evaluated at in a, a complete observation. For an individual that has pain missing, it's a univariate normal calculation. So now it's just the diagnosis observation minus its mean squared divided by its variance. There's no covariance, there's no bivariate nature to it. The total log likelihood would just be the sum of all of those contributions. So I can return that to get the log likelihood function. For a given value of theta, the parameter vector, I can get the log likelihood function. The other function that I defined is for the EEM algorithm itself. I defined a function because I'm going to use the bootstrap in a minute because I want, in addition to what the EEM algorithm is going to give me is uh, a, the set of maximum likelihood estimates for these parameters. So mu, sigma squared, and the covariances. If I want to do inference on these um, parameters, so suppose I want to do a confidence interval for the pain score, or I want to do a confidence interval for the beta 1 hat, or for the beta 1 parameter, I need standard errors as well. The EM algorithm is not going to, by, by default, give me standard errors. It's just going to give me estimates of MLEs. I can, using standard maximum likelihood uh, results, derive standard errors if I know what the likelihood function is. Remember, I can take the negative um, second derivative of the log likelihood and get the uh, Fisher information matrix that has the, the standard errors in it. Alternatively, I can use the bootstrap. I'm going to use the bootstrap in this example. So I'm going to get estimates of mu and sigma hat, or sigma squared p, sigma dp, and I'm going to get standard errors using the bootstrap. That's why I'm defining this EM algorithm function. 
So this function, you provide data, and it holds off and does that whole EM algorithm um, routine that we saw in the notes. The only thing that's special about this function is that it's going to allow for the bootstrap to be called for it. So it's going to, um, if called from the boot function, specify a random set of indices for sampling the rows. But generally, this is the, the algorithm from the notes. So I'm first going to pull out the data of interest. We have data has three columns. It's um, diagnosis, psychological well-being, and pain. We're only worrying about diagnosis and pain. So it's the first column and the third column. The, I also want the third column squared. The sufficient statistics that we needed in these calculations included the, the pain observations, the pain observations squared. So I'm pulling both of those out. Um, initial values, this is just like we did in the notes, pairwise deletion based estimates. So just compute the mean of the diagnosis scores, the mean of the pain scores, ignoring the missing data. The variance of the diagnosis scores will start with a zero covariance and then the variance of the pain scores ignoring the missing data. So those are just initial values. I don't believe those are the real maximum likelihood estimators. And then here's the EM algorithm itself. I'm going to iterate over 100 possible iterations. I'm going to consider that's my maximum number of iterations, up to 100. But I'm going to allow for it to break earlier than that below. Uh, I pull out the current estimates of my parameters, so mu mean vector, sigma 0 variance covariance matrix. The E step is to um, essentially impute the sufficient statistic pieces. I do that by computing, given the current values, the initial values of the mu and sigma um, vector and matrix, I use those pieces to estimate the regression pieces, beta 1, beta 0, and then the, the um, residual standard deviation. So beta 1, beta 0, residual standard deviation. And then I fill in the missing pieces of the sufficient statistics like we said in the notes. So a missing value for pain is equal to the regression model fitted at, that, at the corresponding value of the diagnosis score. So pain gets imputed as the fitted value of the regression model as currently estimated. Pain squared gets imputed as fitted value squared plus residual variance, sigma PD. That's from the notes. Once I have those things done, I had my initial values of mu and sigma. Now I've, I've filled in the, the uh, sufficient statistics for my observed data. I can recompute those mu and sigma parameters. So now I recompute mu and recompute sigma. Because the data are now complete, internally I've made them to be complete, the, the uh, calculations here are very, they're just simple. They're just the mean of um, the pain scores, mean of the completed pain scores now. This is the variance of the diagnosis scores. This is the covariance of the diagno diagnosis and pain scores, same thing. And then this is the variance of the completed pain scores. So I've updated mu and sigma, and the only thing left to do is to check convergence. So I have theta 0, my collection of mu's and sigma parameters that were estimated initially. I updated those estimates to be theta 1. I check whether those things are different from each other uh, to a, su a sufficient degree. If they're not, then I'm going to break. So if the sum of the squared differences between the theta parameters is less than something really small, I'm going to stop. This is how it works. So it took 74 iterations. It did not require the full 100. And we have these as our parameter estimates. The mean for the diagnosis score is 100. It did not change across all the EM algorithm iterations because it was complete. There was, no, um, there was no modification that needed to be done for the, the diagnosis score. Same thing for the diagnosis variance. It did not change. The pain score mean did change. It converged at 10.28 something. 
the covariance did change and the variance of the pain scores did change. So again, all that's given me, all the EM algorithm has given me at this point is maximum likelihood estimates of these parameters. I have mean estimates, I have variance and covariance estimates. If I want to do inference, then I want um, standard errors for my parameter estimates. So for example, if I wanted the confidence interval for mu hat p, the mean pain score, then I would need both this maximum likelihood estimator of mu p and the standard error estimate of that estimate. I don't have that from this output. I can get it one of two ways. I can get it the, the likely, maximum likelihood approach, take the negative uh, second derivative of the log likelihood, and I can get a, a variance covariance matrix that way. Or easily to do in R, just use the bootstrap. So in the boot, using the bootstrap, I can redo that e EM algorithm many times after resampling um, with replacement. Each time I do that, I get a new realization of maximum likelihood estimators. So if I do a bootstrap 100 times, I'm going to have 100 different mu hat p's. Take a, the square root of the variance of those, that's an estimate of the standard error of the mu hat p. So I'm going to bootstrap my EM algorithm function 500 times takes a moment. Once that's done, then all I have to do is, a, is compute the standard deviation of the um, bootstrapped parameter estimates. In, for example, mu hat p, I'll have 500 of them I can just compute the standard deviation of those mu hat p's to get an estimated standard error for mu hat p. So SE estimate. These are the estimated standard errors for the mean diagnosis score, mean pain score, variance of diagnosis score, covariance, variance of pain score. So if I wanted to do a confidence interval for the mean of pain score, I could do um, theta 2 plus minus 1, 1 times 1.96 times SES 2. 95% confidence interval for the mean pain score would go for between those two numbers. There is a package in R that does uh, a limited amount of maximum likelihood based imputation the norm package, it's very limited uh, in, the, in the sense that it only works for multivariate normal data. That's basically what we're doing with our pain example. We're saying we have multivariate normal data. So I have trivariate, or in the example we just worked with bivariate normal data, where I want to impute uh, one or more of the variables. The norm package will do that. So here's what the norm package looks like. Let's see if I have that already. Probably not. Nope, I downloaded. This is the syntax for using the norm package. Um, you specify a matrix that contains multivariate normal data. You initialize the EM algorithm using the em.norm function, and then you pull out the estimated parameters using the getParam get function. So here's the result. It looks very similar to what we had. 100, 10.28, a little bit higher than ours. 189.6, 23.4, 23.38, 8.2, 8 8.2. So very similar. But this is only uh, applicable to multivariate normal data. If I had, say, a multivariate um, or a multiple regression model that I was really interested in, 
more complicated with maybe uh, categorical variables, interactions, and things like that, more complicated than just a, a data matrix that we were considering here. It's more complicated to do maximum likelihood estimation for missing data. There are solutions. There are software solutions. Some of them are mentioned here. So SAS has built in um, missing data handling that uses maximum likelihood. Stata does as well. So does SPSS. R does not, as far as I know. The only thing in R, I've seen a couple of packages in R, but nothing as um, substantive as these three packages here. There are also standalone packages that we mentioned earlier in the semester uh, that cost a lot of money. So Amos, EQS, ListRail, and M+. They all do um, a specialized set of analyses, but included in that is missing data handling that uses maximum likelihood. Okay, the other piece of, the other strategy for doing missing data handling, uh, usually in the context of missing at random, that's usually the context that we worry about. Missing completely at random, who cares? You can throw the data away and it doesn't hurt. Not missing at random, there's not much we can do. So there's a whole separate bag of things that you can try, but we don't consider that a lot because there's not really much you can do. Most of the time you're worried about missing at random. The other strategy for dealing with missing at random is called imputation, multiple imputation in particular. The way that works is you um, specify a probabilistic model for a missing variable in terms of other variables. So suppose we have a regression model with a predictor that's missing. Like we'll see in a second, the HERS data, the HERS data we had, um, I forgot what the primary response was here, but one of the covariates that we were interested in was glucose. These were other covariates we were interested in. Um, if glucose had a missing value, multiple imputation would require that I specify a model for glucose in terms of the other variables, including maybe the response. I'm going to, kind of like we did with the EM algorithm, I'm going to fill in a missing value based on a regression of that variable against the other variables. If I have a missing value for glucose, what's my best guess at what it is? I plug in the covariates, the other covariates that were observed for that individual. And I fit that to get a fitted value from that regression model. I plug that in for the missing value of glucose. The other piece that I need to take care of, though, I don't just compute a fitted value. I also um, add in random error. So this is what this is called stochastic regression in the sense that I'm going to replace a missing value with a fitted value plus some random error. The reason I do that is because if I just do imputation, like plug in a mean or the last value carried forward, um, I get, fit, I get com imputed values and I can do analysis on the basis of those imputed values, but the analysis does not then take into account the fact that I've done imputation. Um, there's no account for the variability that's been induced by imputing a missing value. So if I add in a random error term, I kind of artificially force there to be random variability that's added in each time I impute. That's where multiple imputation wins out over single imputation. You do this many times, or a few times, five to ten times. Each time you do this, you get a new completed data set. So if I have my HERS data, if glucose was the only variable that had missing values, I would do an imputation round, f imputing glucose with the fitted values from this regression model, say, plus random error. That would give me one new data set that has all the glucose variables observed. I could do my analysis using that completed version of glucose. That would give me coefficient estimates and standard error estimates. What I do for multiple imputation is I repeat that multiple times. So I go back and I add a different random error term for each imputed value to get a new data set. Redo my analysis, re-get my quantities of interest and standard errors. Do it again, get a new data set, new quantities of interest and standard errors. So you wind up with five to 10 completed data sets, each of which you do analysis on, from which you get coefficient estimates and standard errors. Um, the challenge then is how do you turn five or ten analyses for five or ten completed data sets 
into a single conclusion. If I were doing regression of um, cardiovascular disease versus glucose and other things, for example, I want to talk about the maybe the odds ratio comparing um, cardiovascular disease incidence to uh, glucose changes. If I did multiple imputation, I get multiple versions of that coefficient estimate and standard error, so five or ten of them corresponding to each of the imputed data sets. What I have to do for summarizing things is average up the quantity of interest, so I would average up like the beta coefficients that correspond to the, the parameter of interest, and I would combine the standard errors in a particular way that we'll see in a moment. But the bottom line is that you do, you impute the data using what's called stochastic regression. You do it five or ten times. And for each one of those times, you do your analysis, get, get your parameter estimates and your standard errors. At the end of all of that, you combine all of those estimates and standard errors into a single estimate and a single standard error. So that at the end of the day, you can do inference like you would want to do. My estimated odds ratio for such and such is with a standard error of such and such. Um, so in the HERS data, suppose I had glucose missing, and I specified a model like this one for imputing glucose. I'm going to say glucose, a predictor variable, not the response, but a predictor. It has missing data, though, so I'm going to re regress it on my other variables. Here is the fitted regression model of glucose on these other covariates from the HERS data. So if I had an individual who was missing glucose, who had a systolic blood pressure of 130, was a non-smoker, was white, and was non-diabetic, I could come to this model and say, plug in 130 for SBP. Um, I didn't specify what BMI was. I'd have to specify what BMI was. Uh, you were white, so that turns on. You are not a smoker, and you do not have diabetes. So you turn that off, you turn that on, you turn that off, you turn that on. I'd have to specify what BMI is. I, I plug in 130 for SBP. That gives me a fitted value from this model. Turned out to be 95.45. That would be the number I would plug in to impute the missing value of glucose for this individual. I would then add in a random draw from a distribution. And the distribution that I draw from is the residual distribution from this, this regression model. So I would plug in 95.45 as the imputed value plus a random draw from the normal distribution with mean zero and standard deviation 30.93. 30.93 is the residual standard error from the model. So that's what I mean by impute the missing data with random error added. I would do that multiple times, capital K times, five or ten times, and that gives me five or ten completed versions of the data set. For each one of those, I can fit my regression model of interest, get the standard errors, and then combine them at the end of that. Skip these two slides. Um, some more detail about multiple imputation. The details are a little more complicated than the way I've pre presented them so far. There's actually a Bayesian flavor to multiple imputation, and we'll talk about that a little bit um, next. So uh, just one slide on some basics of Bayes' analysis. So Bayes' rule says that the, probability, the conditional probability of, of one thing given another is equal to the conditional probability of another given the one thing times other stuff. So the, the conditional probability of, of theta given y can be written as the probability of y given theta times these other pieces. Bayes' rule or Bayes' theorem allows me to switch the ordering of the conditioning when I'm talking about a conditional probability. One major application of Bayes' theorem is in estimation of, of parameters. In a frequentist approach or, or a strategy or framework, you treat the parameters, like a mean or a variance, as being a fixed, unknown quantity in the, per, in the population. 
So the mean glucose is 94.2, period. That's what it is in the population. I don't know what that value is. It is what it is. And my goal with frequentist statistics is to estimate that parameter using data. In the Bayesian paradigm, you treat a parameter as itself a random variable. So the mean glucose would be treated as a random variable. It has its own distribution, conditional on data. So the frequentist approach would say, I observe data that's a function of theta, the parameter. The Bayesian approach would say, there's a distribution of theta that depends on data y. So it's a different way of thinking of things. The Bayesian approach gives me um, a distribution, a probability distribution for a parameter estimate. This is called a posterior distribution. The posterior distribution of a parameter theta, given data, is a probability distribution for that parameter. So I have a distribution that I can play with for mean glucose, for example. Um, the way that I access this posterior distribution is by employing what's on the right side of the equality sign. So the probability of data given a parameter value looks like a likelihood function. This is basically a likelihood function. My, my density of my data conditional on or given a particular parameter value. You tell me what the parameter is, I'll tell you how likely this set of data are. That's a likelihood. This P of theta, this marginal probability that theta takes a particular value, is called a prior distribution. And that's the, only, that's the main sticking point for employing Bayesian analysis, is what is this prior distribution? This is something that I have to specify. What is it? Uh, prior to my seeing data, what is my guess at the distribution for my parameter of interest? That's called the prior distribution. So putting these things together, I have that the posterior distribution of theta given y is proportional to, ignoring this marginal distribution of y, which can be ignored often in Bayesian analysis. We're going to ignore it. It's a scaling factor for our purposes. The posterior is proportional to a prior distribution times a likelihood. So the key is if I can specify a prior and I know the likelihood, I can get this posterior distribution and do Bayesian inference. So who cares? The reason we care is because this actually is the uh, framework for where multiple imputation was um, developed. That's what this was, that's how multiple imputation was developed, was in a Bayesian paradigm. Um, we are talking about a couple of different main parameter types. We're talking about means and covariance matrices. So that's what we've been seeing in the previous examples. If I, I'd like to know a mean, I'd like to know a covariance matrix, that's often what we're interested in. Um, so one consideration before we move forward is what does a prior distribution look like? There's two different, uh, there's a class of priors that, is, that are often used for mean vectors and covariance matrices. Where the way they're motivated is, um, this, a prior distribution is something that I'm going to say, before I see any data, this is what I think describes the spread of a parameter value. What's the mean glucose level? I have no idea. But I think it's going to be between 50 and 150. And I guess it's going to be closer to 100 than it is to either one of those tails. So my prior distribution is going to be normal, centered at 100, with standard deviation, whatever, 25, so that it covers 50 to 100 with 95% probability. I have to use some kind of argument to put a prior distribution on a parameter. Often, we would prefer not to have to specify any real um, prior information when I specify a prior. So if, if I'm nervous about saying the prior distribution is such and such, what I can do instead and still be able to do Bayesian statistics is use what's called a non-informative prior for theta or for, yeah, for theta parameter. I specify a prior distribution, a distribution, but one that really does not um, give any information about the location of where that parameter is. 
for example, a non-informative prior for a mean vector, or for, or for just a mean, consider one mean, a non-informative prior for a mean would be a flat surface that assigns equal weight to every possible mean. If the uh, parameter of interest was a proportion, 0 to 1, a non-informative prior would be the flat prior between 0 and 1, so uniform between 0 and 1. Every probability, every proportion between 0 and 1 is equal probability. That's, I have a prior distribution, I do have a distribution on that parameter, but it's non-informative in the sense that I haven't told you to favor any one particular range over another. So in general, for a mean vector, a non-informative prior would be a multidimensional flat surface that apply, assigns equal weight to every combination of mean values. So I'm not actually specifying any um, prior information about the values for, me, for the mean. Similarly, for a covariance matrix, it's not as intuitive to see this, but a non-informative prior for a covariance matrix is of this form. So the determinant of the covariance matrix raised to the negative p plus 1 over 2, where p is the dimensionality of that covariance matrix. These are uh, widely used non-informative priors when we're dealing with a mean vector and a covariance matrix. They're both called Jeffrey's priors. You can see the textbook, the um, Applied Missing Data Analysis textbook, or any textbook on Bayesian analysis for more details. I mention these because we're going to use these in multiple imputation. Prior distributions, those are the, the main driver for enabling Bayesian analysis. I want this posterior distribution really is my goal. The posterior of the theta given my data is what I would like because that's where I'm going to do Bayesian inference. Give me a, an interval about which I'm confident theta lives in, for example. That's based on the posterior distribution. Before I can do that, I need a likelihood and I need a prior. We just specified what a prior is going to look like for our purposes. It's going to be a non-informative or so-called Jeffrey's prior. That's going to correspond to a couple of standard posterior distributions. For example, the posterior distribution for a mean vector given data in a covariance matrix. When I use the non-informative prior that we mentioned and a normal likelihood, multivariate normal likelihood, the posterior distribution is itself multivariate normal with mean mu hat and covariance matrix capital sigma divided by n. Similarly, the posterior distribution for a covariance matrix, when I assume normality and a Jeffrey's prior for the covariance matrix, is of this form. This is a, probably a new distribution for us. It's, it's called the Y-Shart or inverse Y-Shart distribution, W inverse. So the posterior of capital sigma, covariance matrix, given the mean estimate and my data, is distributed as the inverse Y-Shart distribution with n minus 1 and capital lambda hat degrees of, or uh, parameters. Capital lambda hat is the sample sum of squares and cross products matrix. So it's the covariance matrix, but you haven't scaled by n minus 1. So it's just the sum of the squares and the sum of the, uh, the product, the, the sum of the products x minus x bar, y minus y bar. Sample sum of squares and cross product matrix. Going back to the multiple or to the um, pain example, let me just briefly go through these and we'll finish them on Friday. What we do with multiple imputation is <clears throat> we generate, so we, I talked about stochastic regression. That means you plug in a fitted value from a regression model plus random error. That can be written in another way as fit, uh, imputed value for a missing observation, yt star. <clears throat> is a random draw from a posterior distribution conditional on my observed data and my current estimate of theta. That's, a, that's the same thing as doing a fitted value plus random error. I sample from this distribution. That's like taking the mean, doing plus or minus random error from that distribution. So I get a fitted value for imputing the data this way. That's step one. The step that I didn't mention yet is step two of the imputation algorithm. This is called the I step, so it's like impute, fill in the missing value with a particular number. 
The second step of the imputation routine is called the P-step, where you draw from the posterior distributions of your parameters to get new parameter estimates. So I have mu hat, I have sigma hat, those are my current estimates of these mean and covariance matrix matrices. In the P-step of multiple imputation, I actually generate a new value of capital sigma and a new value of capital, or of mu, by drawing from their respective posterior distributions. So I impute the data, I draw out new versions of the parameters, and then I repeat. With the new versions of the parameters, I can refit the regression model that we talked about earlier. From that, I can um, compute my maximum likelihood estimate, current estimates. I can repeat, I can repeat, I can repeat. So we'll do this on Friday. But this is the idea of um, multiple imputation. I do two things. I do the I step by imputing the missing data first. And then I generate from the posterior distributions new versions of the parameters, I use those to reiterate uh, and go through the process again. I, P, I, P, I, P. I do this many times. In multiple imputation, we don't actually converge in the same way that the EM algorithm converges. There is no um, convergence to a single theta vector. It's rather that we're kind of s sampling from a distribution. We're getting completed data sets, uh, five or 10 of them, um, and I'm not getting a convergence to a particular number for the coefficient estimates. I'm just getting five or ten realizations of the data set that I can do my inference on. So we're going to talk about convergence in a different way in the context of multiple imputation. Okay, I'll stop there. We'll talk more about it Friday. So, last time we started talking in more detail about uh, multiple imputation as a solution for missing data and mentioned that um, that rests on a Bayesian foundation. So we've reviewed Bayesian ideas. Um, a posterior distribution is a probability distribution for a parameter. We treat a parameter as being a random variable in Bayesian analysis. So we're interested in the probability of theta, a parameter, given my data. Typically in frequentist statistics we talk about the probability of data given a parameter value, a likelihood. The posterior distribution according to Bayes' theorem is proportional to a prior distribution, so that's a probability distribution that we specify on the parameter itself. Proportional to a prior times the likelihood. Likelihood requires that we know a distribution for the data. Prior requires that we have some kind of knowledge or are willing to make some assumptions about where the parameters are likely to be prior to seeing any data. We talked about um, what are called Jeffrey's priors. These are non-informative prior distributions for uh, parameters generally, but in particular, since we're talking about means and covariances, there's a non-informative, a standard non-informative prior for a mean, a standard non-informative prior for a variance or a covariance. These, um, in the context of what we're considering, um, posterior distributions that we're going to deal with, specifically with multiple imputation, are these two. So a posterior for a mean or a mean vector being multivariate normal, and a posterior for a covariance matrix being inverse y -shart. Okay, so multiple imputation has, uh, it's an iterative algorithm, and it has two pieces to it, or two steps. The first is called the I step. The I step is where we actually impute the data, so missing values. We do this by drawing from a um, distribution for the missing data, conditional on the observed data, and our current estimate of the um, parameter vector. So by drawing from a distribution, we not only fill in the missing data with an expected value, but we also have randomness associated with it. So if we're doing regression to impute 
these missing values. We could say y miss equals beta 0 plus beta 1, in our case, um, times diagnosis score. So if you tell me what diagnosis score is, which I know for everybody, I can predict what pain is based on that regression model. That would give me a, a constant fixed um, fitted value for each missing pain observation. What stochastic regression would do is take that fitted value and add a random error term. So we talked about that in the context of the HERS data where we regressed one of our covariates, glucose, that had missing data on the other covariates and the response. So we got a regression model for my missing variable in terms of the other variables for which we have complete data. That would give me a fitted value for SPP 130 and non-smoker who's white, non-diabetic, a fitted value from that regression model of 95.45. But that's not exactly what I plug in for the imputed value. I plug that in plus a realization from this normal distribution mean zero with this residual standard deviation. So I'm adding in random error to account for the uncertainty involved in filling in a missing data point. Otherwise, I have the same problems that we talked about with single imputation. So I fill in the data in the I step. And then in the P step, I create um, new versions of the parameters, the parameter, yeah, the parameter estimates. So when I plug in the data in the I step, I now have complete data. And it's straightforward to um, estimate the, the parameter values. So once I have complete data, the mean vector is just the mean. This covariance matrix, matrix is just the sample covariance. So that gives me um, a mu hat and a sigma hat. What I do next is I um, use that mu hat and that sigma hat to generate randomly a new mu hat and a new sigma hat from the posterior distributions for each of those um, parameters. So I say that capital sigma becomes a random draw from this posterior distribution for capital sigma, conditional on my current estimate of mu and my data. So that means I draw from this inverse y sharp distribution that we talked about as the posterior for a covariance matrix. Similarly, I draw from the posterior distribution for mu, um, given the current estimate for capital sigma and the data. That comes from the multivariate normal distribution like we talked about a moment ago. In more general contexts, multiple imputation, um, I impute the data in the I step, so that looks like this a general distribution for the missing data given the observed data and the current value of the um, parameter vector. Generate from that to plug in missing values. And then generally, um, generate a new vector of parameter values theta from the posterior distribution for theta. When I'm just dealing with a mean and a covariance, these are separate steps. I have a covariance uh, Posterior, I have a mean posterior. But generally, if I have a bunch of parameters, I'm doing a regression model, I want a posterior distribution for all those parameters. So here's the pain example and um, how we can do multiple imputation with these data. Uh, I need starting values for the parameter estimates. I need a mu zero hat and a sigma zero hat. And what we're going to do is take the MLE estimates as our starting values. So we computed these using the EM algorithm previously as the MLEs for these um, parameters. The initial I step, um, we're going to say, in the pain example, what we're doing is treating just two variables. We're treating the pain, data, pain variable and the diagnosis variable. And we're talking about fitting a regression model for pain in terms of diagnosis. Pain has missing values, so I want to impute pain and then fit the regression model. Once I have these uh, parameter estimates, we talked last time about how I can use them to 
um, estimate the corresponding regression coefficient and the residual variability. So specifically, if I know the covariance estimate between the diagnosis and pain variables, and I know the variance estimate for the diagnosis variable, then beta 1 hat is just equal to their ratio. Beta 0 hat is my estimated mean for the pain variable minus beta 1 hat times the estimated mean for the diagnosis variable. So that gives me my regression model. I also need this residual variability. With these MLE estimates, that corresponds to these coefficients. So beta 0 hat equals minus 0 0.057, beta 1 hat is 0.123, and then sigma hat squared p given d is 5.32. Given those, um, I can do the I step again. So I have, I essentially now have a regression model for my missing variable in terms of the observed variable. I can use that regression model to fill in or to impute with fitted values plus residual variability. Once I have these quantities estimated, my missing pain observations equal beta 0 hat plus beta 1 hat times the corresponding diagnosis observations plus residual variability. So a draw from the normal distribution means 0 with that variance. That gives me imputed data, a complete data set. With the complete data set, I can recompute my estimates, mu 1 hat, sigma 1 hat. So these, this mu 1 hat and sigma 1 hat correspond to um, doing one I step. Um, so randomly, th these were randomly obtained. If you did this in your code, you'd get slightly different answers. But this is from randomly drawing from a normal distribution with um, that variance, mean zero, gave me data on the basis of which I could estimate with these resulting numbers. That's the I step. The P step is to take these estimated parameters and my data and generate randomly from their posterior distributions new versions of sigma 1 and mu 1, the matrix and the vector. So when I did that from the inverse y chart and the multivariate normal, I got these two quantities, the co uh, covariance matrix sigma 1 star, the mean vector mu 1 star. So you would get, again, different <coughs> values. There's, these are quite a bit different in some cases. So the, the estimated variance for the um, diagnosis variable went from, in the MLE case, 189.6 to after imputation, 199.58. And then when I randomly generated from the inverse Y chart, I got almost 500. So variances vary quite a bit, can vary quite a bit. The variance for the pain variable didn't change as much, <clears throat> and the variances for are the um, imputed versions of the means changed a little bit. But I generate r new random versions of my parameter estimates, and then I repeat. So once I have um, mu hat and sigma hat, I can do the imputation. Once I've done the imputation, I can estimate these parameters again. Once I've estimated these parameters, I can generate random versions of them from their uh, posteriors. And then I repeat. The second round, my I step gave me these uh, regression coefficient and variance estimates. Those gave rise to these new, um, well, gave rise to new mu and sigma estimates. And then these were randomly generated from the posterior distribution. <clears throat> so I step, P step, and we do that many, many times. <clears throat> we do that until what's called convergence. But convergence in the context of multiple imputation is not convergence like it is with the EM algorithm. The EM algorithm is trying to maximize the likelihood for um, the in, in terms of the parameter values. So we converge if the estimated parameter values don't change much at all between iterations. That's how we gauge convergence. With multiple imputation, we're not um, getting increasingly better estimates of the parameters. We're just getting new estimates, randomly generated of the parameters. So convergence has to do with um, <clears throat> achieving what you could call like a steady state of the genera random generation 
uh, procedure. So here's what that could look like. Here's a couple of diagnostic plots for gauging convergence in the context of multiple imputation. So it refers to the distributions of the uh, parameters becoming stable and no longer changing in a systematic fashion. So if I start from bad initial values, the estimated parameters are likely going to change quite a bit in it early on. Um, eventually, they're going to achieve a steady state that looks like something like this. This is when we call the, the posterior distributions stationary. So they're not changing in a systematic way. This is one diagnostic plot that's used for gauging. So you do a bunch of multiple imputation rounds, maybe a 1,000. You do a whole bunch of them. And then you look at a picture like this to gauge um, how which of these imputed data sets should I pull out for my imputed data sets. The reason I look at a picture like this is because the coefficient vectors, the coefficient or, um, parameter vector at one iteration is correlated with the uh, parameter vector at a previous iteration. Because these are randomly generated from starting values that are the previous um, parameter estimate, subsequent parameter vector estimates are going to be correlated with their preceding ones. In terms of generating um, new completed data sets, imputed data sets, I don't want correlation between the new data sets. I want randomly generated um, new data. So what I look at in a picture like this is um, how many iterations should I put in between those for which I'm going to draw out my imputed data. So I might look at a picture like this. Uh, this is a time series plot of the mean for the pain variable. I can look at this and gauge, or try to gauge, um, correlation. So there's correlation apparent when this plot changes in a systematic way like this. So for increasing pain estimates, I tend to continue having increasing pain measurements. For decreasing, I, can, I tend to have decreasing continuously um, pain estimates. So I see what looks like correlation between the imputed data sets in this range. Here's another systematic peak. Here's another systematic trend, some systematic trends here. So what I might look at, look for in a picture like this is how many, what's like the lag that I should impose for drawing out random versions of the data. Versions of the data that have escaped this correlation um, pattern. So for example, I might say 100 iterations. After 100 iterations, I would claim, based on this picture, there's correlation, there's some correlation, correlation, correlation. It looks like it has returned to the same basic area as the initial pain measurement. So I'm going to say that after 100 iterations, I'm confident that I have broken the correlation between this data set, this imputed data set, and this imputed data set. So I might say, I might assume that there's correlation between um, data sets between or within the, zero, the, the first and the 100th iteration. So I look at a picture like this to gauge uh, or to decide on um, what lag should I use in picking out imputed data sets to use for my final analysis. I might do a thousand imputations, a whole bunch of them, look at a picture like this and pull out five or ten. Another diagnostic plot is an autocorrelation plot where we have lag on the horizontal axis and we have a measure of correlation on the y-axis, vertical axis. So for um, estimated pain means, that differ by, let's say, five um, iterations. So the first p-step compared to the sixth p-step, and the second p-step compared to the seventh p-step, and so on. You put all those pairs together that differ by a lag of five, and you compute a correlation between the um, corresponding pain means. And in that case, we got a correlation of 0.0001. 
0.45 or so. So what I might do with a picture like this is look for what lag do I require in order to make the correlation sufficiently small. Sufficiently small is, a, is subjective, just like this picture is subjective, but um, you do the best you can. So you look for this correlation to get small, and it will level off at um, a really small number. So in this example, I might say 100. 100 might be more than I need. A lag of 100 might be more than I need. This autocorrelation plot seems to suggest that 35, probably 50 is sufficient. But um, I've done a bunch of iterations already. Why not just take 100 to be safe? OK, so when I do that, actually, I'm going to take the, every 200. I don't remember why I chose that, but to be extra safe, I guess. 100 is probably fine. Um, once I've made that decision, I say I have, say, 1,000 um, imputed data sets. I'm going to take every 200th one. So I'm going to have five imputed data sets that I'm going to use in my final analysis, five complete data sets. Um, simulation evidence suggests that uh, five or 10 is sufficient for achieving high efficiency relative to the maximum likelihood estimates. Um, so you do very well with multiple imputation with just a handful of imputed data sets. You only get the highest efficiency, though, in theory, with an infinite number of imputations. So the more imputations you have time for, the better your, your results are going to be. The lower the imputation standard errors are going to be. Software, by default, will typically, typically give you between 5 and 10, or 5 and 20 imputations. Once I have 5 or 10 imputed data sets, I have five or 10 completed versions of my data where the pain variable has no missing values anymore. What do I do now? Now I estimate the model of interest on each of those imputed data sets. So in our case, we're interested in the regression model of pain in terms of diagnosis. For each of my five, or ten, for each of my five in this example imputed data sets, I would fit this regression model. That would give me estimates beta 0 hat, beta 1 hat, and standard errors for beta 0 hat, beta 1 hat. For each of my five imputed data sets, I would keep track of those coefficient estimates and those standard errors. What I would like to do eventually is combine those coefficient estimates and those standard errors into a single coefficient estimate and a single standard error. So if I want to do inference on beta 1, say, uh, it's not clear what to do if I have five beta 1 hats and five standard errors estimates. I could do five confidence intervals and, and make a uh, subjective interpretation of those. What I would like to do is be able to have a single confidence interval or a single p-value for beta 1. Here's how I do it. I have five beta 0 hats, five beta 1 hats, uh, and I want, and I have five standard errors for each one of those. I want a single estimate. I want a single standard error. At the end of the analysis phase, where we have capital K, in our case, five sets of model coefficients and standard errors, I create a single estimate of one of my parameters, so beta 1, say, beta 1 hat. I would say beta 1 tilde is just equal to the mean of the five beta 1 hats from the imputed data sets. So 1 over capital K sum up the parameter estimates from the imputed data. So that's easy. I just average up my parameter estimates from the uh, imputed data. For the standard error estimates, it's a little more complicated. You don't just average up the standard errors. You have to, do, you have to account for two sources of variability. So to, com to combine the standard errors, we compute two different quantities, what's called the within imputation variance and the between imputation variance. The within, within imputation variance is what you might expect that you get to do, um, but you don't get to do. This is just the average of the standard errors, or the average of the squared standard errors. V underscore W, the within, within imputation variance, is just the average of the um, squared standard errors. You also need this between imputation variance, VB, which is a sample variance of the parameter estimates. 
So theta hat t minus theta tilde. Theta tilde is my single estimate. So I, I, I average up or I sum up the square deviations of my capital K um, imputation-based parameter estimates from their overall mean. Divide by one or one less than the number of imputations. So it's a sample variance of my capital K um, imputed imputation-based parameter estimates. If beta one hat was what I was talking about, this would be beta one hat t minus beta one tilde. The total sampling variance, which is the basis for the overall standard error I'm going to use for my overall theta hat or theta tilde, beta tilde, is v total which is v within plus v between plus v between divided by k. So it's a correction factor out there on the end. There's um, a, basically a sum of the within and the between variances plus a correction factor, which as the number of imputation goes up, goes to zero. So for lots of imputations, the overall variance for my imputation-based um, estimate is just the sum of these two variances. But in general, I have to have this correction factor. So let's see what this looks like in practice with the pain data. Here are the data. And then down at the bottom is the multiple imputation code. I need a couple of packages. I bet I don't have this one. MC, MC, pack, and mass. Mass comes with R, but I bet MC, MC, pack is not there, so let me install it. MC, MC, pack is the package that I'm going to use for an inverse y sharp um, distribution. So that's not a standard distribution. It's a Bayesian-based distribution. Where did my... All right. So I'm going to actually do a, I'm going to do a whole bunch of imputation iterations, 5,000 of them. Don't have to do that many, but I'm going to do it because it doesn't take that long. So capital B is 5,000. Uh, theta 0, <clears throat> mu 0, and capital sigma 0 are the maximum likelihood based estimates. So I need to rerun my EM algorithm to get those. And then my um, initial values for mu hat and capital sigma hat are those um, corresponding estimates. So theta, theta zero was the vector containing all the parameter estimates. The first two elements were the means. The second element, or the third element, was the variance for the diagnosis variable. The fourth element was the covariance, and the fifth element was the variance for the pain variable. So I'm making a covariance matrix by pulling out each of those pieces. I'm pulling out the bits of the data that I want to work with, and then initializing some empty pieces to hold on to things. Capital B not found. Okay, so here's my loop over capital B iterations. Uh, the I step is here. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to use my initial estimates of mu hat and capital sigma hat to estimate the regression model for pain as a function of diagnosis beta 1 hat, beta 0 hat, sigma hat, p given d, using the formulas from the notes. Once I have those, I can impute the missing pain observations. So yp1, the, the updated uh, version, complete version of my data, all I have to do is fill in where there are missing values. Beta 0 hat plus beta 1 hat times the diagnosis variable, that's the fitted value, and then I have to add in a random draw from the normal distribution with mean zero and standard deviation, the square root of my, or standard deviation, the residual standard deviation from my regression model. That gives me <clears throat> the current version of the imputed data with the 
imputed data, I can recompute or reestimate mu and capital sigma by just using usual MLE um, formulas. So mu1, updated mu hat, is just the mean of the two variables, diagnosis and pain, now with the complete version of pain. Capital sigma1, the new version of capital sigma hat, is just the sample variance of those two variables. So now that I have complete data, those are easy to compute. The p-step is to randomly generate new versions of my parameter estimates. So capital sigma zero, the updated, um, what will be the starting value for capital sigma in the next iteration is from the random inverse y chart distribution, n minus one degrees of freedom, capital sigma one times n minus one. So capital, what I need for the second parameter of the inverse y chart is this capital lambda hat, where capital lambda hat, did I define it? Yeah, capital lambda hat is the sample sum of squares and the cross products matrix. So that's, all that is is the covariance matrix without the scale, without n minus one in the denominator. So that's what I have here capital sigma one times that scale. Randomly generate a new mean vector from the multivariate normal distribution with using the current, uh, the updated estimate of capital sigma. Um, that's for the next iteration. So now I'm gonna keep track of um, the, let's see, where's my standard errors? Oh, we're gonna get that later. So that's my, that's my loop for doing multiple imputations. So let's run that. That's going to give me capital B imputed data sets, a whole bunch of them. I made this, the, uh, holder, the holder, the variable that's going to contain all of the 5,000 imputed data sets, I made that be a list. So um, length of data impute zero is 5,000. The first element of this list is a complete version of my data. So my diagnosis variable and my imputed pain variable. So these are now imputed values, randomly drawn uh, error terms plus fitted values from the estimated regression model of pain as a function of diagnosis. Uh, gauging convergence, I'm going to look at diagnostic plots for each of my um, parameter estimates. Here's the parameter, or here's the uh, time series plot for the diagnosis mean variable. Here I'm not actually doing any imputing. This, the diagnosis variable had no missing values. So this should just be random draws from the posterior distribution for this variable, which would indicate that there is no correlation. There's no correlation between subsequent draws because I don't have, I'm not imputing the data so that the, uh, the previous iteration's data doesn't have anything to do with the current iteration's data. It's always the same. No correlation. So I don't need any lag for, with respect to this variable. I will for the other variables with, that have to do with pain. Here is the pain mean, the plot corresponding to pain mean, and I see clear correlation chunks for this variable. Um, between zero and 50, there's a pretty systematic spike. Between 50 and 100, there's a systematic trend, 100 and 150. Um, so I might choose, I don't know, you might choose 50 because it looks like every 50, it, looks, it has returned to the same neighborhood. Um, I chose 200 because I have plenty of bootstrap, or, um, multiple imputation iterations. Here's the corresponding picture for the diagnosis variance. Here again, I don't expect there to be any correlation because there was no missing data. So this looks like as random as you're gonna get. The covariance estimate should have some correlation because it involves the pain variable. And then the pain variance estimate. Not so much, but there's a big spike in between 0 and 50. So I'm going to choose 
200 based on that picture. You can also look at autocorrelation plots. Here's the autocorrelation for the diagnosis mean. Shouldn't be any correlation. Sure enough, it drops down to basically zero at the first iteration. There is no correlation, regardless of lag. For the uh, pain mean, there is correlation, substantial. Looks like after 50 or so, it's pretty small. 200, it should be tiny. And so on. So here's the variance for the diagnosis variable, no correlation. Variance or covariance variable, some correlation. And then the variance for the pain variable with correlation. All right. So I have decided that I'm going to use every 200th iteration to pull out imputed data sets, capital K imputed data sets from my 5,000. K is equal to 20. Uh, is that right? 200 times. I guess I'm just going to pull out 20. I'm going to pull out 20. I'm not going to use all 5,000. So I'm going to pull out 20 from every 200th um, imputed data set. Once I have those, then I fit my model for each of them. So capital K, 20 imputed data sets. For each one of them, loop over 1 to K, I'm going to do my model, which we said was just a regression model for pain as a function of diagnosis. So this is my a completed data set, the ith completed data set, second column, that's the pain variable, tilde 1 plus first column, which is the diagnosis variable. I'm pulling out the coefficient table, which has the estimates and the standard errors. Um, I'm only going to keep track of beta 1. That's the, very, that's the coefficient I really care about, the, the relationship between pain and diagnosis. So I'm going to pull out the second row, and then I want the estimate and the standard error. I want to keep track of both of those. So the first and second columns of that coefficient table. That gives me 20 um, pairs of beta 1 hat and standard error of beta 1 hat. What I do with those is I pool them by, uh, to, com to construct a single estimate of beta 1 and a single standard error for beta 1. I do that by averaging up the beta 1 hats and by computing these two quantities, the within and the between variance. Within is just the mean of the um, squared standard errors. Between is the sample variance of the um, beta 1 hats. And then I put them together as the square root of the sum of the within and between plus that correction factor, B divided by capital K. So my final estimate of beta 1, of beta 1 is 0.118. My final standard error for beta 1 hat is 0 0.08. So using that, I can do a test. I can do a confidence interval. That's multiple imputation. There are a couple of packages that do multiple imputation. MI, I think, is the most widely used. Um, it's kind of finicky. So in this case, when I run the code, it breaks. It does not, in, in my case, it does not converge. So they have some fancy diagnostics for um, deciding what lag you need in order to achieve no correlation between that, those lags. Uh, and with these data, we'll see if it works here, but with these data, for me, when I ran it a few times, it did not converge. Let's see. I don't think we have the MI package. Let's get it. Have the mice package either. Both of them. 
So the MI <coughs> functionality requires that you initialize your missing data. So you use this MI.info uh, function. And then you use the, the core MI function to um, get multiply imputed data sets. So that gives me capital K imputed data sets. I think it gives me five by default. And then there's a function, there's a variety of functions for doing, fitting a model using the imputed data sets and then doing the pooling that's required. For linear regression, <clears throat> there is a built-in lm.mi function that when I specify a formula, will take the multiply imputed data set or variable from mi and do the regression, get the capital K estimates and standard errors and then pool them like we need to. Here's the estimated result. We've had this problem before. And I don't know what the solution is. So I, in, I installed MI and then it tells me there's no package called MI. So I'll leave it to you. It works for me, works for me on my computer. Uh, maybe it's a, a version issue. That's code for using MI. Again, when I use it, I don't get convergence. There's another, it's an older package. Or actually, this one might be the newer one called MICE that does similar things. Um, I use the main function MICE to get imputed data sets. And then I apply the LM function. I can do that with the with function. And there's a pool function for taking the collection of LM outputs and getting the um, pooled estimates and standard errors. So here's what I get. And in this case, they don't match well what I got when I did it manually. So I think the multiple imputation code is finicky. Um, it's, gonna, it's going to vary from implement, implementation to implementation necessarily because there's randomness involved in the imputation process. Um, the estimated beta 1 that we had, beta 1 hat, was 0.117. The estimated beta 1 for mice was 0 0.08. I trust 0 0.118 because I got that out of a textbook. I matched something from a textbook. I don't know why mice is not matching that well. Um, my estimated standard error, beta 1 hat, was 0 0.08. The estimated standard error for mice was 0 0.05. So technically doing multiple imputation, but I'm a little wary of it. OK, so that's missing data. Um, remember that it's an important consideration, but it's one that gets short shrift often. Uh, we typically just let R throw away our missing data and do um, pairwise deletion, not worrying about it. But there's a lot of cases where, with missing data, you can think up a reasonable uh, scenario or explanation <clears throat> for the missing data being missing at random. <clears throat> and <clears throat> when we have missing at random data, there can be substantial biases in the results of our estimates and inference if I don't account for the missing data correctly. <clears throat>